Actually, no, we have only finished half of verse 1. So we'll pick it up in the middle of verse 1, and we'll also cover verse 2. Woo! Let's read those two verses, 2 Peter 1, 1 and 2. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we lift up this time in your word. It is a precious, precious time, a very valuable time for each and every one of us as we gather together to corporately study your word, to show ourselves approved, Workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, that doesn't apply just to pastors and leaders. It applies to every member of the body of Christ. That we should all be able to rightly divide your word of truth. To understand it. To be able to apply it to our lives. And allow your word to impact us in such a way that it affects what we think, what we believe, and how we live. We ask you to bless this study this morning. For your sake and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we learned a little bit more about Simon Peter. We talked about him, his background, the things that God did with him, in him, and through him. And he had identified himself here as, first of all, a bondservant, a slave of Christ, voluntarily entering into slavery for the Lord God Almighty. That's what we all uh, do when we lay down our lives to follow Him. <clears throat> and an apostle of Jesus Christ, so we covered that. And we move on now. <clears throat> we find out who He is writing to. We find out about Him, and then we find out about those to whom He is writing. To those who have obtained like precious faith, with us. <clears throat> the New American Standard Bible says it like this. Those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. The New Revised Standard Version says those who have received a faith as precious as ours. I like that translation referring to that faith which Peter and the other apostles possessed and the same faith that his readers possessed described as being precious. It's the same kind. It's a precious faith. But when Peter says, with us, who is us? Who is ours? Peter is speaking here of himself and his fellow apostles. We read in Acts 2.42, as they continued steadfastly. This is the early church. All the believers that came together had all things in common, the early church there in Jerusalem, which was comprised, obviously, almost exclusively of Jews, because that's who lived in Jerusalem. All the early converts were Jewish. Jesus was and is Jewish. But as they, the early church, the Jerusalem church, continued steadfastly in four things, and these are linchpins of the New Testament church, and number one, the apostles' doctrine. Then you have the fellowship, breaking of bread, which involved communion, and also what we would call a potluck, the, the love feast, the fellowship meal, which included communion. Heavy emphasis on the body of Christ coming together. But number one, the apostles' doctrine. And that's what Peter's talking about here. Those who have obtained like precious faith with us. The faith that you and I possess, which is laid out clear, clearly for us in the Scriptures, was first imparted to us by the apostles. We talked about the apostles last week. There are only 12. They imparted to us their doctrine, which has become the foundation of our faith. And so Peter is referring to those who have taken hold of that same faith which he and the apostles first possessed. Jude 1.3. Jude was a brother of Jesus. He wasn't one of the twelve. In fact, he didn't even get saved until after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. But he was truly converted 
half-brother of Jesus, son of Mary and Joseph. And he wrote this one chapter book, but it is chock full of good stuff. And he says in verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. So in essence, he's saying the same thing that Peter is saying. Like precious faith with us, common salvation. So Jude's original intent in writing this small book, this letter, was to talk about what we call theologically soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. But he said he had become aware of a bigger problem. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. Because already in the first century church, there were false teachers that were leading people astray, bringing heresy into the church. So he shifted gears from teaching about salvation and wrote a letter warning about false teachers. That's Oh, thank you, John. Thank you very much. I don't, did anybody even use this today? We can just put it back here. Really get it out of the way. There we go. Thank you. We wouldn't want anybody not to be able to see me. We'll put this down too. Because I'm not that tall. Even though I've got my cowboy boots on and that gives me another inch and a half maybe. Inch and a quarter. See, there's a method to my madness. So he says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly. So Jude says he wants us, as followers of Christ, to contend earnestly, to stand firm, to fight for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. You see, there are those certain segments of the church today. We have the seeker-friendly, the purpose-driven, and so forth the emergent, and they used phrases like, we need to reinvent Christianity. I don't know about you, but that scares me to death. We didn't invent Christianity. God did. He is the author. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Who are we to say we need to reinvent Christianity? We need to change it up so it will fit with the 21st century. Does that sound biblical to you? Does the Holy Spirit living inside of you bear witness to that idea? No. 2,000 years ago, Jude says that the faith was once for all delivered to the saints. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. See, He is our foundation. The Holy Scriptures are our guidebook our manual, our textbook. The idea behind a manual or a textbook is to give you guidance, whether it's if you're trying to put something together, there's instructions. How many of us know a lot of people don't read the instructions? <laughs> Gee, what, what, why do I have all these extra parts? Right? How come it looks crooked? How come it doesn't work? And a lot of people do that with spiritual things. They don't follow the manual. They don't follow the textbook. But the idea is, when you receive a manual or a textbook, it's not your place to change the manual. It's the manual's place to change you. Once for all, delivered to all the saints. Because the Bible is a divinely inspired, God-breathed manual, there's no need to change any of it. The idea is it's supposed to change us. That's what Peter's talking about here. Some would say, you've probably heard this, it doesn't matter who or what you put your faith in as long as you have faith. How many of you have ever heard that one? That is ludicrous. Some people put their faith in crystals, right? Tinfoil hats. Swamis, guru, gurus, maharishis. Some people put their faith in athletes and entertainers. And that's insane. It absolutely does matter. Peter would heartily disagree with that statement. Doesn't matter who or what you put your faith in as long as you have faith. 
That's another part of that universalist deception. All pathways lead to heaven. All you have to do is be a good person, live a good life, and whoever or whatever God is will accept you and you'll go wherever you're supposed to go. We know this verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, not just any old thing or any old person, whoever, some people believe in Elvis or Michael Jackson. Insert your favorite idol. The scriptures make it clear, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 14, 6, another biggie. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you know what that means in the Greek? No one. No one. No one comes to the Father except through through the Son. This is the faith that was once for all delivered to all the saints. So it doesn't matter what anybody comes up with in 2018. If it doesn't line up with this, you have to reject it. You have to ignore it. You have to flee from it. And yet many are running to these false teachings today that contradict the Word of God. Peter is writing here, folks, I said at the beginning, we found out who Peter was last week. Now we're finding out who he's writing to. He is writing to true believers. If there are true believers in the world, there were in Peter's day, there are today. If there are true believers, does it then stand to reason there are also false believers? Peter's writing to true believers. Those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, born again by the Spirit of God. So first, Peter has revealed to us who the recipients of this letter are. And now we find out how they obtained. How did they get to this place where they obtained a faith as precious as that of the apostles? And it is a precious faith because it's the only faith that can save any human being from the fires of hell. I'd call that pretty darn precious, wouldn't you? And I found myself again last night as I was doing my bedtime prayers, a practice that I have followed since I was a little kid, getting down on, I don't, haven't gotten down on my knees lately, I probably should. But when I was, I used to get kneeled down by my bed every night and say my prayers because that's what I was taught to do. But I found myself again last night thanking God for making himself known to me. Do you realize how precious that is? Do you realize that most people don't have that? The ability to really understand and recognize and believe that God is God, that he's the creator of all things, the master of the universe. And I trust that most, if not all of you here today, have had that same revelation. But we take it for granted. And we shouldn't because it is precious and it is vitally important because it's going to determine where you and I spend eternity. This life was short. This life was temporary. The big league, not bigly, but big league is heaven and eternity and paradise with God. Okay, so how did they get there? How do we get there? By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I've said it before and I'll say it again because it says it right here. We have no righteousness of our own. For all those who sadly believe they can somehow gain entrance into God's eternal kingdom by their own efforts, they are sadly greatly deceived because it's only by His righteousness by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And it doesn't matter. Now, some people are better than others at giving an outward appearance of holiness and spirituality. And oftentimes, that's very misleading and deceptive. But we have to go by what the Word of God says. There's none righteous, no, not one. And so those that you may 
look up to and revere and honor. And again, that's not a bad thing. Paul says, be ye imitators of me, even as I imitate Christ. But again, what, what are the characteristics and qualities that we see in Christ that should be imitated? Humility, servanthood, right? And oftentimes we revere people who don't necessarily exhibit those qualities. But they might be charismatic. They might have a very dynamic personality or they might be very um, accomplished orators and so forth. Those are not the qualities that Paul is talking about when he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Humility, brokenness, servanthood. Those are the things that we should imitate. Isaiah 6, uh, 64, 6. We are all like an unclean thing. That just, boy, that flies in the face of modern uh, spiritual correctness, if you will. Unclean thing, how dare you say that to me? I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And you're telling me I'm an unclean thing? I'm going somewhere else. I came here to be made to feel good. Well, then you're going to have to pretty much throw out the Scriptures because the Scriptures tell us who we really are. In the book of James, it says the Scriptures are like a mirror. We look into the mirror to find out who we are. I had somebody flick donut crumbs off of my beard this morning for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> but if you don't look in the mirror, you might go out looking pretty bad, pretty ridiculous, right? Right? That's why we have a mirror. Now, some people use the mirror too much. <laughs> but there's a purpose so that we can make ourselves presentable. God's mirror, the Scriptures, show us who we really are so that we can get right with God and then become that person that He created us to be and that He died on the cross for us to be. Make sense? We are all like an unclean thing. And again, if you've got cancer and you go to a doctor who's more concerned about making you feel good than telling you the truth, and he tells you, oh, it's nothing. No big deal. Don't worry about it. It'll go away. And then you die of cancer because you were misdiagnosed and mistreated. Are you now happy that he lied to you to make you feel good? I don't think so. God tells us and shows us who we really are so that He can turn us into who He created us to be. By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, Isaiah 64, 6. We are all like an unclean thing, all of our righteousnesses. And what He means by that is what we think are our righteousnesses, right? Sometimes we do something that appears to be righteous and we're real proud of ourselves. Wow, I did really good. God says... All of our righteousness are like filthy rags. Boy, does that burst your bubble. But you know what? Your bubble needs to be bursted. Because it's really not good to be living in a bubble. We all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, having taken us away, So no human being in and of themselves could ever be called or considered righteous. Romans 3.23 confirms this. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And these are good verses to use if you're trying to witness to someone, share your faith, show them why they need Christ. These are good, good verses. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. People will say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy doesn't matter. God doesn't grade on a curve. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some people may have committed sins which in our eyes are greater and graver than others. But to God, sin is sin. Any and all sin will separate us from Him because He's perfect. He cannot allow imperfection. He cannot allow sin into His presence. And so it is always and only by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that we may be saved. Romans 4, 5. But to him who does not work for their salvation, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, 
See, some people think you have to become godly first, and then you're justified. Well, there's a problem with that, because you can't become godly without His help. He justifies the ungodly. You come to Him in all of your ungodliness, all of your sinfulness. You confess your sins. You repent, and He justifies you, which means it's now just as if I'd never sinned. I did sin, but God washes our sins with the precious blood of Christ. In the Old Testament, it says He casts them as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. I love that. Thank God. To him who does not work, believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So how is it that we may obtain that same precious faith that Peter and the other apostles had obtained? It's by faith in Christ, his redemptive work on the cross of Calvary, his atonement for our sins, and then our faith is accounted for for righteousness because we become clothed in the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He, the Father, made Him the Son who knew no sin and that's the only reason Jesus was able to die on the cross for our sins is because He became God incarnate, God in human form, God in the flesh and He had no sin. He lived a perfect sinless life. Therefore, He was able to die on the cross as the substitute for our sins. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The only way you can have righteousness and remain in a state of righteousness is to be in him, in Christ. Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Paul says, Yet indeed I also count all things loss, For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And again, in in some parts of the world, people have experienced that today. Paul lost everything. He lost his his, uh, standing within the uh, Jewish community. I'm sure he was no longer a part of the Sanhedrin. He was rejected. Jews, especially in that early time, but even down through the centuries, when a Jew would dare to become a follower of Christ, they'd be cut off from their family. They would have a funeral for them. They would consider them as dead. And because, for the most part, livelihoods were accomplished within the Jewish community, if you were cut off, you lost your livelihood. You lost your business. You lost your friends. You lost your family. You lost everything. How many of us would be able to endure and stand firm in our faith if we had to go through that. And we know even beyond that that they were, in many instances, killed, martyred for their faith, Jew and Gentile. He says, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Anything that this world may have to offer. Paul says it's just rubbish, it's garbage compared to knowing Christ, that I may gain Christ, be found in Him, having not, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. And by the way, Paul's not saying that you can become righteous by following the law. Study the book of Romans. The whole point is the law proves that we are not righteous because we cannot follow it 100%. No human being is capable of living a perfect, sinless life. Jesus is the only one who's ever done that. That's because he's God incarnate, God in the flesh, Paul says, not a righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. This is how Peter's readers, and that would include us here today, obtained that like precious faith. It was by embracing the apostles' doctrine, which clearly teaches the only pathway to Righteousness, holiness, forgiveness, salvation is through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the righteousness that He imparts to us as we put our faith in Him. 
I want you to note something. I kind of skipped over this, but notice, we mentioned this last week, and I want to point it out again. Make special note of the fact that Peter refers to Jesus as our, what? God and Savior. Do you see that? Again, if you ever get into a debate, we've got so many people out there who want to say, well, no, Jesus never claimed to be God. That's something the Christians made up. Jesus was a good man, a good teacher, a prophet, and so forth. Sadly, he died a tragic death unnecessarily. It was absolutely necessary. But for those who claim the Bible does not teach that Jesus is God, this is just one of the many scriptures that absolutely does say exactly that. Peter refers to Jesus as our God and Savior. Put that one in your file. Okay, verse 2. Hallelujah. Verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. So one thing we see here is that his readers, as those who have come into possession of that same precious faith as the apostles, they already have grace and peace. Peter says, let it be multiplied to you. Let it increase. But this is a, a, a greeting that Peter, Paul, and John all use in their New Testament letters to the various churches and groups of believers. In fact, this phrase, grace and peace, is found 18 times in the New Testament. I think we all know what these words mean, but let's just refresh our memories. Grace, God's unmerited favor towards us. Getting what we don't deserve. That's the grace of God. By grace we are saved through faith. We don't deserve to be saved. We already saw. We're an unclean thing. All of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We are sinners. We are born in sin. We're conceived in sin. But God's grace says, you know what? I love you anyway. He proved it by sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Peter says, grace and peace. Grace is God's unmerited favor towards us. We get what we don't deserve. We don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve eternal life. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again today as well. There are people out there who say, well, I want what I deserve. I want what's coming to me. Really? Do you really? I don't think you do. It's funny because people think they deserve a lot more than they really do. The fact of the matter is we deserve eternal punishment in the fires of hell. Again, that kind of strong language doesn't fly too well in today's world, but it's in the Bible. We already talked about that the Bible is the authority, not you, not me, not any other great so-called philosopher, theologian, statesman, orator. The bottom line is God has the inside track. He's got the copyright on truth. Now, I'll just throw this in as a bonus. <clears throat> I, I li liken it to a two-sided coin, which all coins are two-sided. The other side of the grace coin is mercy. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. We don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve forgiveness. But by the grace of God, we can have it if we want it. By faith. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. We've already talked about what we do deserve. So God's grace and mercy, two sides of that coin. But then we also have peace. It's another important element. Jesus, is one of his many titles, is Prince of Peace. He rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey. In times of peace, the king would ride a donkey. In times of war, he would ride a horse. Guess what kind of animal Jesus is coming back on? A horse, baby. A horse is a horse, of course, of course. For all you old timers. Oh, Wilbur. <laughs> but when he came on Palm Sunday, riding in down the Mount of Olives into the eastern gate, in the city of Jerusalem, he was riding a donkey, proclaiming peace. The Prince of Peace. He came to bring peace.
to the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. Again, peace in the biblical, spiritual sense, which really involves mental, emotional, physical, because how many of us know that when you are lacking peace in your life, when there's tor turmoil, when there's unrest, it even manifests itself in your physical body, does it not? You can feel physically sick when there's no peace. He came the first time as the Prince of Peace, the King of Hearts. He's coming again. As the Lion of the tribe of Judah riding on a white horse will be coming with him. And it'll be his time to rule this planet. But peace, as we read about it in the Bible, Jesus said, peace give I to you, not as the world gives. Had some interesting events this past week over in Korea or in Singapore. We talked about this last week. We prayed for a, a good outcome. It would appear that there has been a good outcome in spite of all the negativity coming from the mainstream media, that there really could be a possibility of a nuclear, a denuclearization of the North Korean or the Korean Peninsula. But another aspect of that is an, an, an end to the Korean War, which has never officially ended after uh, 67 years, I believe it is. I don't know how many people even know that. The Korean War has never officially ended. And so many times what we see passed off in the world is peace. It's very unstable, very unreliable. And for many people, peace is merely the lack or uh, the absence of conflict. There's peace in the home because you and your wife or husband haven't been fighting this week. So you're at peace. But it could erupt at any moment, right? <laughs> That's the kind of peace. You know, in fact, if you look at it, I can't remember the exact statistic, but if I, my memory serves me correctly, there have not been more than 20 years at a time over the entire course of human history that somebody in the world has not been at war. Did you know that? So there really hasn't been any peace on this planet since Adam and Eve blew it in the Garden of Eden. But God has a peace that he imparts to us, his children, his followers. And Peter says, let it be multiplied to you, the grace and the peace. Peace in the Bible means we're no longer at war with God. Because that's exactly what we are until we come to Christ. Until we're born again by the Spirit of God, like these true believers to whom Peter is writing. Peace, real peace means you're no longer at war with God. You're no longer fighting against Him. Remember we read this last week where Jesus said to Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. That sharp pointed stick that the shepherds would use to drive the sheep and to protect them from wild animals. It's hard for you, Saul, to kick against the goads. And everyone who is fighting God, fighting Christ, resisting Him, is kicking against the goads. Peace means you're no longer at war with God. And you have that inner witness of the Holy Spirit inside of you that you are forgiven, you are saved, set free, and on your way to heaven. It's what we talk about often as being the fact that we know that we know that we know. That's peace. That's the peace that passes all understanding that we read about in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. The peace that strengthens you and comforts you in the midst of the trials and turmoils of this life. And no matter what may come our way, we know at the end of the day, we are God's, He is ours, and we're going to spend eternity with Him. That's peace. <clears throat> Romans 5, 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also we have access by faith into this grace by which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And that's why Peter and the other New Testament writers would often interject this into the opening statements of their letters Grace and peace to you. And in this case, Peter says, 
Let it be multiplied. Let it increase in you. Because we stand. By grace we stand. God's unmerited favor. Whenever the devil comes and tries to lie to you. And tell you you're a dirty, rotten, no good scoundrel. Just say amen, devil. You're right. But by the grace of God, I am forgiven. I am saved. I am set free. And I'm going to be spending eternity with him in paradise. So take a hike. By grace we stand, and we have that peace in the midst of the storm. Peter, Peter's desire for his readers is that these virtues will be multiplied in their lives as they walk with God on a daily basis. Because what does he tell us next? In the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord. So grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. The only way that anyone can become a recipient of God's grace and his peace, Peter says, the knowledge of God, it's by knowing him. There's that old uh, bumper sticker. Um, <clears throat> N-O, no God, no peace. N-O-N-O. -N -O. But no God, K-N-O-W, and no K-N-O-W, peace. Get it? We can't not know true peace without knowing God. And obviously, without knowing and understanding His grace that He has imparted to us by sending His Son to die on the cross for our sins. So this multiplication of God's grace and peace in our lives. Because we have that honeymoon time as a new believer. When you first come to Christ and you first feel that tremendous weight of sin lifted off of you, uh, how many remember what that feels like? Wow. You're forgiven. Wow, that's amazing. The weight is off. I don't have to carry the burden anymore. Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Cast all your cares upon me. Oh, man, how refreshing. But then as we go through life, we realize that even we're now, though we're now forgiven, and we've been given the precious gift of eternal life in Christ, the struggles of this life do not cease. And in fact, in some ways, they get even more difficult. Because you now become a target of the enemy. Before you were in his camp, you were gradually rotting away, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. The devil wasn't worried about you. But now that you're born again by the Spirit of God, you are definitely the enemy of the enemy. And so in some ways, it becomes more difficult. And that's where this multiplication of God's grace and God's peace, because the more we grow in Christ and mature in Christ, just like Paul said at the end of his life, I'm the chief of all sinners. When you're first born again and you're in the honeymoon phase and you feel so great, you're not thinking a lot about that. All you know is, boy, I'm forgiven and it feels so good. But if you study the writings of many great men and women of God, the more they grew and the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, as they matured, the more aware they became of their sinfulness. And so the more aware you are, the more you need that multiplica multiplication of grace and peace in your life. And as you become more of a target of the enemy. There's that old expression, ignorance is bliss. The Bible says sin is profitable or enjoyable for a season, there's a season out there where you're having all this so-called fun and sin seems like a pretty cool thing. But eventually it will take you down. So anyway, Peter says that the multiplication of this grace and peace will result as we Deepen our knowledge of God and, our, and Jesus Christ our Lord. So it happens by opening our hearts and minds to the love made manifest to us through the death of Christ on the cross. And by the way, this might surprise you a little bit, maybe not. But faith and knowledge go hand in hand. Romans ten seventeen, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's not logos there, the written word. It's rhema, uh, rhema the spoken word. But what it means is that people come to faith 
through anointed preaching and teaching of the Word of God as the Word of God is spoken into your hearts and minds and you respond to it. Faith comes in that manner. Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by warm, fuzzy feelings. Is that what it says? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some people think in order to be a follower of Christ, in order to have faith, you have to put your brain in neutral, far from the truth. God created your brain. God gave you a brain. The problem is, when we're steeped in sin, our minds are twisted. We don't think straight. We don't think right. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then there's a connection between the, the mind and the heart where that knowledge, when, when knowledge becomes faith, is when it's transferred from the head to the heart. And here, when Peter uses the word knowledge, it means full or true knowledge. Proverbs 1, 7. Now, people think the beginning of knowledge comes when you start school and you go up through the grades and the, more you, the higher you go, the more degrees you have, the more knowledgeable you are. What does Proverbs 1, 7 say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Therefore, if you do not fear the Lord, and that means to have respect for Him, to be in awe of Him, to believe in Him, to have faith in Him, the fear of the Lord, if you don't have that, you can have all the degrees in the world. According to the Bible, you're a fool. We have exalted human knowledge, human wisdom. We should be exalting the knowledge of God. That's what we should be exalting. Knowledge without love, and that is the ultimate manifestation of the Spirit of God living inside of us. It's agape or agape, unconditional love. The, the love that we find in the New Testament that speaks of the love of God, that self-sacrificing love, expecting nothing in return, when we are able to exhibit that in our lives, that's the ultimate expression of the Spirit of God living inside of us. So knowledge, in fact, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, that's what it's all about. Go home and read it. Knowledge without love leads to pride. Do you know that? And that leads to arrogance, liberal theology, and even apostasy. Do we all know what apostasy means? That you fall away from the faith. Someone very near and dear to me, I won't say who, this goes back quite a number of years now. This person went to work. This person used to go out to Caro's and different places. How many of you remember Caro's? Doesn't exist anymore here. Witness to their contemporaries. Go on mission trips. Lead worship. Write worship songs. Read their Bible every day. They went to work in a bookstore and in the bookstore there was a section of Christian literature because the people who owned the bookstore were supposed to be Christians but within the context of that Christian section there were many books that what we call higher criticism how many of you know what higher criticism is this is basically the intellectual liberal theologians and their writings which many times dispute what you and I believe to be the cardinal Beliefs of the Christian faith, the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, and so forth, the atonement. Higher criticism. And higher criticism came into the church because of an exaltation of knowledge over love. The love of God. And they intellectualized it. And it became a worship of the human intellect rather than a worship of the living God. Well, this person began to read these books. And this is why many of the so-called higher educational institutions that are supposed to be Christian in this nation are dangerous. Because many of them teach these same things. 
And that's why in Calvary Chapel cir- circles, we often re- refer to sem- seminary as the cemetery. I'm not sure. That I can al- Actually, I can almost guarantee you there are more people coming out of Christian colleges and seminaries that go in believers and come out non-believers than the other way around. That's a sad thing. Well, this person began to read the higher criticism. And eventually, because this person was and is very intelligent, and this is a battle, again, we exalt human intelligence. And yet many times I see people who may have some kind of a handicap or something, and I'm almost jealous because I see in them a very simplistic attitude and approach to life and we look at them as being the ones, especially within the liberal, secular world, these are the people they want to get rid of. Hitler did that in World War II. With, they were killing off the mentally retarded. I don't think that's the correct phrase anymore, but I can't keep up with it. What you're supposed to say and not say. Not say? Not see? <laughs> Hello? That's Margaret Sanger in eugenics. Do you know that she's the founder of Planned Parenthood? You know what the original goal of Planned Parenthood was? To eradicate the African-American community. And yet today, large numbers of women have been sucked into the whole Planned Parenthood system. See, every <laughs> it's just amazing. I mean, the devil is not, greater is in he that is in us than he that is in the world. But the devil is no dummy. And he sure knows how to mess with people's minds and twist things around and make wrong right and right wrong. Good evil and evil good. The whole lie, Planned Parenthood is about women's health. The practices and the tenets of Planned Parenthood destroy women's health. That's the truth. Wow, really spinning off here. Not sure how I got there. Let me try to regroup my thoughts. Knowledge. The exaltation of human knowledge and intellect. So anyway, to make a long story short, this person no longer follows God, doesn't appear to believe in God, and yet at one time gave every indication of being a true born-again believer. And the number one thing that took them off track, and by the way, they're now very highly educated, and making a lot of money. The thing that led that person down the wrong path was the exaltation of human intellect and knowledge. A famous man, I can't remember his name, there's actually a display about him in the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Uh, Ken Ham's museum there, now they have the Noah's Ark. Well, in the Creation Museum, there's a whole display about this guy who was a contemporary of Billy Graham. In fact, many people considered him to be the greater of the two evangelists. This man got sucked into evolution. He rejected creationism, became a proponent of evolution, ultimately totally resented and renounced his faith and wrote a book about it. And yet, in the early days of their ministries, he and Billy Graham this guy was considered the preeminent evangelist of the two. I don't remember his name. You could probably look it up and find it on the internet. True story. And yet today, this whole idea of exalting and worshiping human intellect and human knowledge is hammered and shoved down the throats of our young people today when there is nothing wrong, in fact, being a craftsman, having a trade, is a very honorable thing. And those are things that you learn through apprenticeship. You learn to be a luthier, you know, a a builder of guitars by studying under another luthier. You learn to be a cabinet maker by studying under another cabinet maker. All these trades which are disappearing from our society and from our culture and which provide many opportunities for people to earn a good, decent, honest living. And you've got multitudes of these Kids who have pursued this human knowledge and intellect now have worthless degrees and owe the government hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're living with their parents at age 30. 
You think I made a good point here? Absolutely. It's irrefutable to tell you the truth. First Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 8.1 The Apostle Paul, who was a very knowledgeable man, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a member of the Sanhedrin. He said, I consider all that as rubbish that I might know Christ. He had to reject all that. It was messing him up. It was messing with his mind and his heart and his spirit. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. I said it may, leads to pride and arrogance, liberal theology, apostasy. Paul says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up or edifies. That's what it means to edify. It means to build up. Love, agape love, the fruit of the Spirit and the life of the believer. As we exercise that towards one another, it builds us up in the faith. But knowledge for knowledge's sake puffs up. Makes you prideful and arrogant. If we continue to pursue, pursue knowledge, not for knowledge's sake, but for the purpose of knowing God better, more deeply and intimately, then grace and peace will be multiplied in our lives. We should study to show ourselves approved. We should study the scriptures, but not for the, the sake of intellectual exaltation, because God reveals himself to us in and through his word. And as we study that, seeking the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the impartation of, of knowledge through the Holy Spirit, Jesus said he would send the comforter. The comforter would lead us into all truth. But again, those who have sought knowledge for knowledge's sake and intellectuality, it's actually produced the opposite result. Grace and peace has not been multiplied to them. They have become apostates and fallen from the true faith. You can receive Christ. Oh, man, I totally lost track of the time. I only had three pages today, too. I thought, surely, you know, we can get through that. You can receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, be forgiven of your sins, and become a partaker of eternal life through Him, and never do anything else to advance your spiritual growth and maturity. Because we are all saved by grace through faith, you would still ultimately go to heaven. Do you know that? Now, there are some circles, some groups, very legalistic, that would try to tell you, if you don't do these things, you're going to lose your salvation. I don't believe that. But we've, we've talked this morning about the danger of departing from these things. I don't believe God can or will take away your salvation. However, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that you can willingly forfeit it. You can walk away from God, like this man who is the associate of Billy Graham. And that's the danger. You could get saved, be forgiven, and never do anything else again to promote spiritual growth and maturity in your life and still go to heaven. But for one thing, you'd be worthless to God here on planet Earth, which could result in an early departure. 1 John 5 talks about that. A sin that does not lead to death versus one that does. Without pursuing an ever-growing, ever-deepening relationship with God, we will never fully know and experience the abundant life God has for us here on earth. John 10.10, 10, I've come that you might have life, life more abundantly. If you choose not to pursue a path of spiritual growth and maturity, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, having grace and peace be multiplied in your life through the knowledge of God, you will not live that abundant life that Christ promised. And many people get frustrated and upset and they say, I don't understand. I received Christ. Why is my life so lousy? What are you doing to grow in the Lord? Are you going to church? Are you fellowshipping with other believers? Are you studying the scriptures, uh, being taught the scriptures by a, a pastor, teacher? Are you studying them on your own? Are you going to prayer meetings? Are you going to Bible studies? What are you doing to promote spiritual growth and maturity in your life? Because God told me years ago, if you want my best, you need to give me your best. Does that make sense? You can settle for mediocrity and still go to heaven, 
but you are at great risk. Because theoretically, and I used this analogy a few weeks ago with regard to the church, if you're not growing, you're dying. And see, that's what happens with the human body after a certain point. The human body stops growing, stops developing, and at that point, the death process begins. Did you know that? And it takes many years, and some of us are farther along that path than others, and you feel it more and more as you get older, right? If you're not growing, you're dying. And if you're not doing these things that we've talked about, then you're not growing. Because God doesn't just wave a magic wand over you and sprinkle some pixie dust on you, and you're perfect. No. It's just like when God told Joshua to go in and take the land of Canaan. I'm giving it to you. He says, this is yours. All they had to do was fight a bunch of Canaanites and bleed and die in battle to get that gift that God had given them. Salvation's a free gift. Being a disciple of Christ will cost you everything. Are you willing to pay that price? That's the question. We'll never fully know and experience the abundant life God has for us here on earth if we don't pursue knowledge. Not for knowledge's sake, but for the sake of knowing Him more intimately, more deeply, that that grace and peace might be multiplied in our lives. Peter doesn't want it to diminish. God doesn't want it to diminish. He wants it to multiply. And we might very well end up a hot mess by the time we get to heaven. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 3. Some people getting in as though escaping through the flames. Whew, that was a close one. Didn't know if I was going to make it. Oftentimes, this is kind of a sad statement, but I think it's true. Oftentimes, a sinner is happier than a believer who does not consistently pursue the things of God. Did you hear what I just said? Oftentimes, a sinner is happier than a believer who does not consistently pursue the things of God. This type of believer lives under the conviction of the Holy Spirit without experiencing the joy, peace, and righteousness that comes from a strong, intimate relationship with God. You could, I mentioned earlier, ignorance is bliss. Now, eventually, you're going to have to pay the piper, as Barry McGuire wrote many years ago. Don't you know someday you're going to have to pay the piper, but in the meantime... The ignorant believer is often happier than the complacent, apathetic, inactive Christian. When you know day in and day out because the Holy Spirit's telling you, hey man, you're not doing what you ought to be doing. You're not living the way you should be living. You need to get right with God. And you continue to resist that. You are much more miserable than the person who's lost in sin because they're blind. You're not blind. God has opened your eyes. And you see the right way, but you're choosing not to pursue it. Quite possibly the most miserable person on the planet is the one who tries to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. And eventually you're going to go one way or the other. And if you don't choose to go the right way, you're going to tip over in the wrong way, I guarantee you. James 1, 5 through 8 will close with this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. Well, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Did you just hear that? The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We've talked recently, we had a message about that, how God wants to stabilize us, make our lives stable, built upon the rock, immovable. The double-minded man, the one who tries to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God, is unstable in all of his ways. Do you want to be stable or unstable? Do you want to have God's grace and peace multiplied in your life, or do you want it to diminish? You know what? If you're going to go with God, and I believe most people here today have made that choice and that decision to go with God, you need to go all in. Nothing short of absolute surrender will do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for that grace and peace that's been made available to us by faith in Christ, the forgiveness of sin, the inner witness, the assurance of salvation. 
And Lord, we thank you that it's your desire, that your grace and peace, which we first experienced when we received Christ, it's your desire that it would be multiplied to us. But Lord, we know that we need to pursue knowledge, not for knowledge's sake, because that puffs us up. It makes us prideful and arrogant. But we need to pr pursue the knowledge of you. We need to, to know you better and better each day. Father, I pray for anyone and everyone here today who needs to recommit their life to Christ or anyone who needs to accept Christ for the first time, that you would draw them by your spirit, that they would come forward today and make that decision, make that commitment. For those who are sensing a need for the baptism, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, that power that they need to live the Christian life to the full, whatever it might be. And for those who are needing prayer for the sickness, for healing, that you would also draw them today. And we thank you, Lord, as we trust, as you've spoken to us about this, to to have this special time of prayer today for healing, that it's your desire and your intention to do some healing here. We thank you and we praise you and we ask you to preside over these closing moments of our service this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.